The speaker tonight is Dan Godbu. Dan and his wife, uh, Teresa, sailed their Beneteau 331 uh, down the St. Lawrence to Bay Como uh, back and back to Kingston in June 2019. Now this was his retirement trip and I guess had COVID not happened, he might have had several retirement trips, but like many things, they're on hold until we're finished and maybe we're finally finished now. He's gonna cover uh, his six week trip, uh, trip sailing, down the, sailing down the river and uh, I don't think it quite went just like the song, like smooth sailing down the river. Um, in any case, uh, he can talk about that in a few moments. Dan's been a member of NSC since uh, 2003, but he started sailing much earlier. Uh, he tells me he got hooked on sailing uh, at age 11 when his dad bought a snark sunflower sailboat at the Eaton's catalog for him and his brother. And uh, he sailed it on a small lake in Bay Como. Uh, I related to him that I know the sea snark sailboat too, and uh, perhaps one that's the snark sunflower, which maybe is the upgraded version, because I used to see it when my mom took me to the A&P store to buy groceries. It was filled with Campbell's soup and it was in the window and it had to sail up. <laughs> And it was a great prop, I guess. I'm not sure what sailboats had to do with selling Campbell's soup, but that's where I saw it. In any case, sailboats are somewhat magical, and uh, like my sailboat, I guess, over the years, they grow. And uh, that snark has now grown into a Beneteau 331, and that's what uh, Dan uh, was in with Teresa as he went down to uh, where he was from, uh, Bay Como. So please welcome uh, Dan, uh, who's going to talk. Thank you. You want to test this before I start? We're good? All right. So um, I was asked to come over and give a, give a talk about two years ago, I think, Park. And uh, I've sort of stepped away from it. And then finally this year, I said, OK, I'll do it. And it's, uh, it was quite an opportunity for me to take a sailboat from Kingston all the way home to Bay Como and back. Uh, never sailed on the St. Lawrence before, uh, other than taking the ferry from Matan to Bay Como uh, in all different types of, do we need to turn that one off? because I get some back. Is it better? OK. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a bit of an overview, who I was with, uh, where we went. We didn't do that in one run. We could have, but uh, that was a leisurely trip. That was my first retirement trip, so I figured we'd take our time. Uh, talk about the challenges, what we went through. We went through some locks. Small locks, big locks. Uh, talking about navigation on the St. Lawrence. Everybody thinks the St. Lawrence is a nice, big, wide river. It ain't so. Uh, talking about currents and tides. We're not used to that over here. We got a one knot current in the river here and not much tide unless you've been drinking. <laughs> and several other things. And then I'll talk about highlights. And this is where you'll see the pictures and stuff. So. I'll try to get through the, the first part fairly quick and get to the highlights. So, the, oh, I'll use the arrows. So the, the crew, so I went over there with my wife, who's still married. She's, <laughs> she's not here tonight. She saw the presentation and she didn't want to be sitting in the front here and having everybody looking at her. So she said, I, I asked twice, and that's it. You don't ask more than twice. But she saw the presentation, and she's okayed it. And I had my brother with me on the eastbound. Went to pick him up in Quebec City. He left his truck there and went straight to Kingston, and we started sailing from Kingston. Went all the way home, and he took care of getting his truck back in Quebec City later on. And I had some friends come through from Iroquois, 
to um, Montreal to give us a hand with the locks. Um, so I have Charlie Jessam and René Frigo with me. They're in the back. You can ask them questions and I'll uh, vet the answers. <laughs> and I had Pepper on board. So just before, we had decided to do this trip pretty early in the fall, said we'll do this in the spring. Our cat got diagnosed with uh, diabetes and uh, we had to give it an, a needle in the morning and at night, so couldn't leave the cat with anybody. You say, well, the cat will become a sailor. <laughs> Pictures to come. <laughs> so here's the crew. This is uh, one of the locks in the States. Uh, you see Renee, Charlie, my brother Gaston, and my wife Teresa. And this is the other crew. And as you can tell, really happy to be on the sailboat. <laughs> so Pepper wasn't quite that happy to be on the sailboat. But you'll see as the trip went on, he became more familiar and he uh, did pretty well. So where did we go? I do have a marker pointer. So I was starting in Kingston. The boat was um, at Portsmouth uh, Olympic Harbor. So I had it in Kingston for five years, three years at Treasure Island and two years at Portsmouth. Uh, we did the Thousand Islands, Lake Ontario, more on the um, eastern part of, of the lake itself, never ventured to Toronto. And uh, went all the way, we followed the St. Lawrence through Montreal and through Quebec City, through Tadoussac and to, uh, to Bake Mall. In the straight line, because I didn't want to sit down and do all the, the exact distance, but in straight line it's 475 nautical miles. I figure I did about 550 one way, so 1,100 nautical miles. So this is what it looked like when we left. Now, we left Kingston on the 3rd. I'll give you the dates. That's the next day we left Brockville. As you can see, nice and sunny and no wind. That pretty much sums up the trip. So any questions? <laughs> um, it was nice and sunny. And if you remember June of uh, 2019, there was seven or eight feet above Datum here, and it was cold as hell. We left, the morning we left Kingston, it was minus two. And we were going east, and we didn't know where we were gonna face. So we left on the 5th of June, sorry, not on 3rd, on the 5th, stopped in Brockville, then stopped in Iroquois. First time I go through that channel in Iroquois, it didn't bother me to go through the channel in Iroquois. I wasn't looking for rocks. We had three feet over Datum, so I was pretty good. Picked up Teresa, Charlie, Renee, and, the, uh, and Pepper, and headed up. Took our first lock at Iroquois, and stayed overnight in the Chrysler Marina. The next day we went by seaway to Beauharnois, and then missed the last ferry, or the last lock. Then the next day went to Montreal, then to Sorel, Portneuf. You see Montreal, we stayed a couple days, I'll talk about it during the highlight. Uh, went to Portneuf just before Quebec City. My great-grandfather and my father and my grandfather were living in Portneuf, so that was a part of, of my trip, I needed to stop there, and I'll talk about it in the highlight. Went to Quebec City, went to saint jean port joli I'll talk about anchoring at one point. Went to cap -Aleg, which is um, in between La Massif and La Malbaie, on, on the north side of the St. Lawrence. Went to Tadoussac, I'll show some pictures in the highlight and went home to Bake Mall. Uh, came back, just Teresa and I, left my brother at home, left our crew friends in Montreal. They didn't do that part this time around, maybe the next time. We went to Tadoussac, 
Capaleg, Saint Jean Porcheli. Remember the word anchoring in Saint Jean Porcheli is not there. Um, went to Quebec City, to Pont Neuf, Trois Rivières, Sorel, Longueuil, Valleyfield, Iroquois, Brockville, and Kingston. You can see there's a few more stops on the way back. That's because we're going against current and have to calculate, and I'll talk about it. <coughs> All right, the first part that I want to talk about is the St. Lawrence Seaway. St. Lawrence Seaway is for commercial vessels. They say, bring your boat, come anytime you want. The St. Lawrence Seaway is for commercial vessel. You have no rights and you have to wait until there's room for you to get through. As long as you know that, it's fine. As long as you have time. When I say we didn't make it to Bournois, somebody told me, oh, it doesn't matter. If you get there, they just close out, come back and get you. Wrong. They won't come back and get us. We made it to the lock at Bournois, and they looked at us, and they say, by the way, get out of the channel. Go back to Valleyfield. Um, it was 8 o'clock at night, 7 o'clock at night, and we didn't want to go back out in the dark to Valleyfield, so we cheated. We went halfway, found a little bay, and anchored in a little bay, and nobody came and talked to us. Um, so when I say not too friendly to pre pleasure crafts, the, the system is not. You call, you try to talk to them on channel 13, 1, 3, and they won't talk to you. They say, no, this is only for emergencies or commercial. They say, well, how do we talk to the people at the locks? Well, you go there, and there's a little telephone on the side. You got come close to the, to, to the lock, get off your, your boat, go in and talk. So as long as you are familiar, it's all advertised in their book uh, as to what you have to do. But think that in this day and age, you could call in with a cell phone. No. You have to get off, use their phone. Um, you need to pay in advance. They don't take money at the lock. You have to go online and pay ahead of time. It's pretty simple, but you got to know, right? And you have to have your receipt somewhere to show them because then they, it takes a lot less time for them to find the receipt in the system. Um, and except for the two locks in the States, when I say you got to get off and talk to them with the phone at the lock, down in the States, they will let you talk on channel 1-3. And they were actually very nice, uh, teaching us how to do it when we went in the lock. Um, same thing with the bridges. They will open. Uh, you need to call them on channel 6-8 with your VHF. That's the only way to contact the bridges. And uh, you have to wait. Sometimes we waited over a half hour in the Montreal, part of Montreal and the Seaway, where one of the bridges to cut to left up, and it finally did. But now the bridges are free, not like the uh, Murphy Canal in Trenton, where it's five bucks at every uh, bridge. These ones are free. So that's the Seaway. Easy to take. I'll talk about the locks. So this is the friends that you see on the, in the seaway. You have some medium-sized ships. You have some much bigger ships. Um, and they, they um, are going straight. You stay away from them. There's no problem. Uh, they're not maneuvering that fast. So the first part. We got my bearings. First lock is in the Iroquois, right here. That's to uh, get you used to the locks. It's only this high. Okay, it's it's not much. It's only three feet, but you got to go through the whole process and and go in there. The second one after Iroquois is down in the states. I got to get the next. So the second lock is Eisenhower, is right here in the States. Um, you're not entering the States. 
you're staying in the Seaway, uh, you don't need a passport, but I, I would say have one just in case you need to stop and go on land. But as long as you stay on your boat and you go through the locks, you, you are not entering the States. The next one, the first one is here, Eisenhower, the next one is about 10 miles to the east. Uh, biggest thing is life jackets, compulsory, as you're going through the whole seaway. Uh, they don't come and disturb you in the lake itself, but as you get in locks, no, no life jackets, no entrance. So pretty simple. Um, this is the American uh, lock. They have bollards. I think I can see the one on the other side. Um, you, you tie up to the bollard to midship and this floats down with you. Um, the two American locks are set up that way. The Canadian locks, they're set up with lines. You'll see some lines and a few other pictures. Um, it's easy to go down the lock because Buddy is right there beside you and hands you a 50-foot line. When you're coming back, Buddy is 50 feet up in the air, throws you a 50-foot line. <laughs> this thing in the back of the boat here, not too good for, for catching a 50-foot line. <laughs> You got to open up everything because they're throwing it at the stern of the boat and at the bow. So, it can get pretty intimidating as you go down. This is uh, not even halfway down, yeah. So, the, um, the two American ones are about 40 feet. The Bois Noir are about a 45 feet. Um, so it's pretty intimidating when you come back, you get 50 foot to look at. So you come out to the States, go around, and I'm losing my bearings here. Chateau Gay around. Yeah, sorry. The locks are right here, the Bois Noir ones, and this part is in Montreal. So you're completely out. Somebody was asking me before, you don't need to demask anywhere. Um, all these, all these, uh, that seaway is meant for very large ships, so none of us have problems. The, uh, the bridges that need to go up, go up to about 60 feet, and I don't know anybody here on this area that has a mast over 60 feet. Um, so it's all good. This is just to show the wall at Bois Noir. This is what you could see from the boat. Now, as soon as you come out, something is necessary, is to have a beer with your crew. I'm not sure what she's drinking because it's not a beer. <laughs> but we'll say it was a beer, okay? When you see her, say it's, you had a beer. <laughs> All right, navigation. The St. Lawrence, like I said, is not the big wide body of water. That's a little river inside a nice big blue shallow water. That's what the St. Lawrence is. It's very shallow and uh, reacts very much like a small river as, as opposed to a very wide body of water. So, all that water that was leaving here in 2019, going to Montreal, and then going down the St. Lawrence, down to Quebec City, I can tell you that in that little channel in the middle, the current was between five and seven knots. So, um, and at the same time, you're gonna meet large ships, you're gonna meet ferries, that don't go in the same direction. They gotta meet barges, 
And the barges is, I don't have, I didn't have a picture and I didn't take one. The barges are getting pushed by tugs. Some of the tugs have got a second story where somebody can be up there. A lot of them don't have a second story. They go behind that barge and they just push it and they check their navigation equipment. You get tides. Once you get close to the Saguenay, you get tides up to 18 feet. It's quite something. And uh, you get fog, fishing boats, fishing nets. I had zero fog. I had zero wind, but zero fog. <laughs> so zero waves, that's a good thing. <laughs> but the wind on the St. Lawrence, we had some wind. The wind on the St. Lawrence, you can look at all the forecasts that you want, and it will tell you the wind's coming from northwest. On the St. Lawrence, not coming from the northwest. If you're going east, it's in your ass. If you're going west, it, you have it on the nose. It's like a channel. The winds are coming from either side and get to the St. Lawrence, and they just go through the St. Lawrence. Very rarely will you have wind in the St. Lawrence that's coming from north or from the south as you're going west and east. So that's something that I didn't know, that I learned as we were going. It was very difficult to sail because that little channel that I said at the right depth um, goes like this. So you need to stay in the channel, and if you want to go downwind, you have to jibe all the time. Jibing in, uh, in a larger boat, when you have ships coming at you, you feel a lot of it is for later. Once they get to Tadoussac, then we get lots of water and lots, lots of stuff. So we motored most of it. We sailed a little bit, but not that much. So the channels themselves, um, this is nice, well marked, right? Easy to see. Uh, you'll see later as I talk about uh, the trip itself and the highlights. When I'm coming here, this is Paul Neuf, by the way. Uh, the big ships do not drive their boats on the St. Lawrence. They pick up a pilot uh, just west of and they drop them off in Les Escoumins. So all, all this has been driven by, by pilots on the St. Lawrence because it is difficult to, to maneuver. This is um, east of Quebec City. Um, the St. Lawrence Channel divide in, divides in two. Most of the ships We'll go in the north side, and you've all heard of uh, Bay St. Paul or Ilocud. The uh, ships, as they turn here and they go around, um, with the tide going out, there's 12 to 13 knots of current in that little elbow there. Whoops. In that little elbow here, as the tide is going out, there's 12 to 13 knots of current not for sailboats. So, early on, you decide, I'm gonna take the south. This, this south channel here is very narrow over here, but it lets you go all the way past this, this island. Not too many ships are going there. So if you're going down the St. Lawrence, that's the way to go. Uh, one thing that's important to note is that most of the marinas on the south side, uh, you need to be at high tide to get in the marina, most of them. So uh, this is, makes it difficult. And then as you're staying in the south, just uh, after um, St. jean paul Joli, I stopped twice, you can reconnect with the North Channel. As you can see, the ships are coming through both, both sides, but you can reconnect with the North Channel in order to get to Tadoussac. And then once you get to Tadoussac, there's a little bit of water. 
It doesn't matter if these numbers are in meter or in feet or in fathoms, 423 feet is, <laughs> is deep enough, right? So this is what it looks like, except that as you're coming out the Saguenay River, you get into the St. Lawrence, you've got a big obstacle here, remembering that whatever you see on the chart, whatever's in green is in the water. So it looks like water, but there's one foot of water right in the middle of the frickin' St. Lawrence, when there's 400 feet on one side and 400 feet on the other side. But you don't need to go there. So, all right. So the currents and tides are uh, extremely important. Uh, we are not used to it, but you have to get tide tables. And anybody that ventures in the St. Lawrence <coughs> should buy this book. It's the Atlas uh, for, uh, of Tidal Currents. Because the tide, we're, we're thinking of the tide as something that's nice and even. The water goes up 18 feet, goes back down 18 feet. It doesn't work that way. The sea goes up, eight, or it's about six or seven or eight feet that the sea goes up. But as it goes inland, that tide just comes in and gathers speed as you get around. That's why when you get close to uh, Ilocud, you get the normal current, which at, that, at this time uh, when I went was about four knots in that area, plus eight to nine knots of current because of the tide. This book shows the whole St. Lawrence completely and gives you the predicted um, tidal currents based on the hour of the day or based on where you are in the tide, um, you know the words I'm looking, the way, cycle, yes. So you have to use the tide tables, they're up to date, plus this book, merge the two of them together and calculate what's, what you're gonna face. Going out, it's not so bad. Coming back, it's totally necessary or you'll never make it back. Um, so the other thing that I don't have there is that we're not too used to anchoring in tidal areas. So we anchored at St. jean paul Joli, and I lost my nice big stainless steel anchor uh, because I calculated that, that the current and I said everything's good, it's going to be from there the whole night. And the tide brought me over, around, over, around. And it was nice, and the road was tangled around my keel. Uh, something pretty bad. At 7 o'clock in the morning, I tried to get the boat out of there. Couldn't. I was afraid to maneuver the boat where the road was. So it finally broke. So um, the, the people are used to... Uh, anchoring in, in tides told me, well, you didn't have, and I don't know the word in English, but magirit. Anybody knows what the magirit is in English? So you drop a weight from, um, from your bow to right on the road to bring that road straight down onto the, onto the seabed so that when the boat goes around, does it get tangled in, into, the, into your keel. So I looked sounded a little stupid when I talked to the guy about buying a new anchor. And, um, but I got a Rockner 12 out of it, so I'm, I'm okay. I got rid of an old Bruce, and, but it's not stainless steel. <laughs> All right. Anybody recognize this? So it's in saint Helene in Montreal. And we just come out of the seaway about uh, 200 meters to the left of the, of the picture or to the east of Ile saint hélène And you can see the Jacques Cartier Bridge. How much time did it take us, Charlie? Three and a half or four hours? From, from here to do the mile and a half that goes there, because the marina was straight across, took four and a half hours. Yeah. Finally get out of the channel and Charlie is still mad at me because I get out of the channel. 
So if you can't get out of the channel, I said, I have to, otherwise we'll never make it there. I'll show you pictures of uh, Montreal once we get there. But that's what the current did to us on the sailboat. Uh, the maximum you can go really is six and a half, seven knots under engine. And that's pushing your engine probably to, to a lot. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the visibility on the St. Lawrence. Um, I put a radar on my boat just for that trip. I was afraid of fog. Most people that have gone through the St. Lawrence have hit some fog between Quebec City and Tadoussac. We were lucky. We didn't get fog. It was cold all the time at night and during the day. It didn't warm up, so we didn't get any fog. Um, I wanted to talk about EIS, all the ships at EIS. Um, you can have it on your boat, that way you're 100% visible from the ships. Fishermen have not bought EIS. They go on their way all the time, the same place, and if you're in fog, you won't see them unless you have a radar. Um, I want to talk about radar deflector. Uh, the radar deflector is so important on your boat because a sailboat is not seen at sea. There's not enough metal on it. Most of us have um, fiberglass boats. If you've got a steel boat, it's different, but if you've got a fiberglass boat, you're not seen. Those nice little yellow radar deflectors that are sold are useless. They look good, people put them up. If you have two spreaders, you put it as high as you can. You can barely see it on, on the big radar. You need, you need a much um, bigger uh, radar deflector. The big ball is what you want to put to be seen, and as high as you can put it safely. Um, and at the same time, if you have a radar you, uh, you can see uh, weather coming or in, in front of you. Oops. This is not moving anymore, so. Yeah, I'm trying to get to it. I don't have a cursor. I'll use the mouse, sorry. I'm an Apple guy. Now it's uh, frozen. OK, I found the mouse. All right. So these two ships that you see here on my radar, there's one here and there's one here, um, we're going to meet right in the middle of the channel. Well, I took the pictures, so I'm no longer in the middle of the channel because you see how close they are? These ships meet and you don't want to be there. <laughs> um, same thing on the radar, I saw something coming. It was coming here. Well, this is what was coming. It's not Canadian, it's American. And I didn't know what it was, so I went on the EIS, and I got what it was, it's USS Billings, and destination unknown, okay? And at the same time, if you're using AIS group with group captain, this is what you see, and you can click on any of these ships to find out what, what it is. And that's how I found out. And I talk about the radar detector. That's mine. And it's as far up and away from all the sailing uh, parts that you have so that you can be seen. Right? Now, other challenges that I put down, how are we doing for time? I've been talking for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, okay. So the only thing I want to say is review your comms. Uh, they don't like you to go on 
one six or on one three and not using proper uh, comms procedure, they'll stop talking to you. Uh, not on one six if you got a mayday, but uh, on one three they will. Um, I talk about South Shore. Oh, pump out. There's no pump out east of Capelag. Capelag is in between La Malbe and, and um, Bay Saint Paul. And as soon as you go beyond that, there's no pump out. We found out the hard way. Um, <laughs> we didn't fill it up, but we had to go to Bacamo and back to Capital Egg. I could have pumped it out in Bacamo, bring one of the drainage uh, trucks that could have pumped it out at a very high cost to do it. It was 200 bucks to get my, uh, my boat pumped out. So I said, well, wait until we get back. Um, I won't talk much about uh, Lac Saint-Francois. This is a remnant of the mayflies. The mayflies actually filled up, and we had a picture, but Charlie lost it. His computer blew. <laughs> His computer blew. Uh, in between the mast and my bimini, that whole space, which is about this much, was full with mayflies. And they couldn't fly in my enclosure, but they could walk on it following the tubes. They were just walking in. So it was quite something. And the, uh, the logs are all over the place. All right, highlights. I'll go pretty quickly. Montreal. Um, oh, that's just a picture of the back of my boat. But I want you to take a look in the horizon and see how many, how many sticks you see. There was only one other sailboat in the, in the Montreal Yacht Club. Because of all that current, they never told me that there was seven, almost seven knots of current to, to get in there, but there was no sailboats. But we were there on the F1, I was there, on, we were there on the F1 weekend so it was pretty lively. Uh, you're going to see for a second as I'm going around here. I'm just looking around the boat. These pyramids, they were dancing all night. <laughs> it was quite the party going on. And then you see the, uh, the stuff. A good place to be. And we managed to get in town and go have a drink. That's why I wanted to go to the uh, Montreal Yacht Club, because it's right in old Montreal. You can go for a walk. But remember, is if it's, that's all because of the water that we had here that was going down the uh, Ottawa River and right into Montreal. That's why they had so much current. All right, Paul Neff. That's the speed I was going at on my sailboat, going east, going down river with the tide. And I had to make that corner over there. So I didn't want to miss the corner. <laughs> you don't want to miss it. Uh, this is uh, my mom's hometown, which is right next over here. So I can see my grandparents' house over there. So it was important for me to go take a picture on the way. And for all the French Canadians and the engineers in the room, this is an uh, important part. That's Paul, Paul de Quebec, where most of the, and I didn't put mine back on because I can't, it won't fit. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was nice. Now you see the, the water? We were sailing there, finally had a sail. So we, we had, a bit. As you get to Quebec City, um, you can see the size of the Coast Guards compared to what they have on Lake Ontario, so you know you're getting to big water. Um, this is the Citadel um, up in Old Quebec, and this is the view of Chateau Frontenac from the water, and this is downtown where we parked. You can see 
Chateau Frontenac right here. And that's the back. Beautiful marina. Um, all brand new docks with all the services in the docks. You can get uh, pump out right at your uh, parking space. They, they don't have fuel yet, though. They, they were still thinking of putting fuel on the docks, but you have to go fuel at another place. Tadoussac, small marina. Um, call ahead of time. There was no problem to get, to get um, a dock, but remembering this is early in June, and we were still wearing big coats, or willies, as Charlie would say, uh, because it was cold. It was still under five degrees south, uh, Celsius most of the time. My boat is, oh, my boat is just, you see the bow here. Well, one thing I didn't say is our dinghy is on the, is on the deck. You can't pull the dinghy in the seaway and the locks. Uh, you can't pull it behind your boat. It has to be on your boat. So we left it there. This is uh, a little whale. And I think I can. Why does it stop? Keep an eye. That's right behind my boat. You'll see some up there. You'll see some water splash up. Uh, yeah, right there. Did you see that water splash in the red corner? Yeah. Wait. So what you would see. So this is what you would see, and I'm trying to look at the words. I know them in, in French, but um, so there's a mink, mink whale and the fin whale. The fin whales were the big ones. The mink whales were the two that came out at about 20 feet behind my boat. And there was a lot of uh, harbor seals all over the place. There were some, uh, a lot of belugas. Uh, my brother and I saw one come upside down, a mother with a baby that was breastfeeding, came all the way out upside down so that the baby could breathe and went back down. No, we don't have a picture. We just were looking. We weren't thinking of taking pictures. And these are the larger, the two that we just saw a splash. That's taken with zoom because they were far away. Uh, they wouldn't come close to where we were. But we went in, went to see the fjords, um, remembering the tides and the current, because the current coming out of the Saguenay is about at eight knots. Can't get in unless you have a tide pushing you in. So, and you see the kind of day that we had? See any waves? No way. Nope. And then we went from Tadoussac to Bécamo. Same thing, except we, we finally got a bit. So the distance directly from Tadoussac to Bécamo is 92 nautical miles. We sailed it in one shot. So we went from Tadoussac to Rimouski to Bécamo. We went this way at 42 miles and back across at 54 miles. And this is the highlights. This is sunset, the two pictures on the left. This is moonrise in the middle. And this is the sunrise the next day. This is what we encountered in the channel. At least they were all well lit up. <laughs> we stayed away from them. We looked at the radar before crossing the channel because you can't see them at night, but you can see the lights. But uh, we managed to do it. And Dad's coming home. Um, yeah, Teresa's there. She's drinking, no beer. <laughs> she's, 
She said I would pick on her if she came here tonight. So this is my hometown, which is a year-round port. Um, it's a paper mill city with aluminum uh, production. It was the largest production in the free world while there was a Cold War, but I think we're back to the Cold War again. So it's still the largest producer in the free world. Um, this is the harbor in Baie-Comont. See how flat it is over there? Normally, it's not like this. That's why the walls are as high as they are there. And this is almost a high tide. The return trip. <coughs> Leaving, now you see what you saw as I came in was the um, aluminum plant. This is the paper mill. And I'm going upriver and I'm going 8.7 knots. Well, I'm using the tide to push me up on, on the St. Lawrence. Uh, the picture on the right is the marina in Trois-Rivières, which they give that information right on their website. If you're leaving Quebec City, uh, it tells you if you're going b between five or six knots, which most of us would go, you have to leave Quebec City uh, as soon as the, you hit low tide. And then you leave Quebec City. The only problem with that is when you get under the Quebec, uh, the Quebec Bridge, Pont Quebec, you get about three to three and a half to four knots of current. So you have to know that it's going to take you an hour to cross a very short, uh, a very short distance. But other than that, it tells you what speed and where to, when to leave Quebec City. We didn't care as much. Um, this is the bifurcation mark in Tadoussac. Can't miss it. It's about 60 feet high. <laughs> That tells you where the, the Saguenay River is. Now, you see these little white things that are coming at me? <coughs> There'll be more. Be more here. That, that wouldn't stop. But as soon as you see a whale, you have to go to neutral. If you're on, under sail, you can sail away, but you can't have your engine, you can't have your prop going as soon as you see one. I had one come, before I filmed this, I had one come right <coughs> under the boat. And yes, I don't have a I don't have a picture because I didn't expect it. I just went down on the on the swimming platform and this thing started coming and I didn't have time. So as you come down the river, come back, this lighthouse um, before Capaleg, so in between Tadoussac and, and Capaleg is is a big lighthouse. There's no road going to it. They only get their stuff from the sea. There's absolutely no road coming. The, the highway is way above the mountain and there's nothing coming down. So that was my speed going under um, Pont Quebec. So I did use the tide to push me through. I got my cousins with me. I talked about um, Buying your um, buying your your uh, passage through the locks, you can do it online, and you get a picture that you can keep on your phone. And the lines, you see that line that Teresa's holding in the front, that's what they throw at you to go up. So what was next for me? Uh, no, I'm not going back down the St. Lawrence. I use the road, and I go with Teresa on the motorcycle. <laughs> That's the following year when you couldn't go anywhere with the boat, so I went by a motorcycle. All right, I'll take questions before they close the bar.
authorship. Let me see here. Okay, we're going to do questions and answers, just like you said. Yeah. Now, if there's questions here in the audience, could you use the microphone so the people out on YouTube land can hear your questions as well? So, uh, any questions to start with? Please line up and uh, let's uh, quiz Dan here. I'm just curious if you had to worry about, like, did you have to do anything to vote to get ready in terms of you're going into salt water, so going from fresh to salt, and then back? Is there anything yeah, there? Yeah, so I knew I was going to salt. As long as you have your, your uh, ablative paint on, I got VC-17 on the boat. Uh, I wasn't going long enough to really worry about it because I'm going, I was going for uh, about two weeks or three weeks in salt water. So salt water started um, not quite where the tide starts. The tide starts at uh, Trois Rivières, but because the tide starts there, the brackish water gets pushed all the way to there. But really, salt water is supposed to start at Ile d'Orléans in Quebec City. So, uh, but it gets pushed in all the way to Trois-Rivières because of the because of the tides. So, so yeah. no, nothing special. The other thing is that the water's freezing, so uh, <laughs> it's less likely you'd have marine growth uh, there yeah. than if you went down to Florida. But corrosion, right? So if you don't have a zinc um, anode, you should have a, your zinc anode on because you're going to sell water, but for, for three weeks, you're not, even if you don't have one, you're not gonna chew on your, on your prop or on your shaft that much, so. Uh, I'm not familiar with your boat. Uh, what size motor do you have on it? So I have a Westerbeek uh, three piston, uh, 27 horsepower with a, just a double prop. It's not a folding prop, but it's been plenty. It carries me at 5.5 to 6 knot at uh, about 2,800 to 3,000 RPM. So it goes to 7 at 38 and 4,000 RPM. But we have two. Yes, Mr. Hey, Dan. Yes, sir. Uh, in the locks, you may want to mention about the fender boards. Yes. For going through. So um, you saw the locks, you saw the color, you saw the the grime that was on, on the side. So if you want to protect your fenders and if you don't want your fenders to get damaged, the best thing to do is to uh, install a board on your fenders. So you have two or three fenders uh, where you normally place them against a wall and then you put the board over top of them so that that's what's coming up and down the wall, not your fenders. So it works very well, and then when you don't need it, you just bring it up, leave it against your stanchion posts on, on the lifeline, and you can sail with them up, so. You mentioned that you were motoring most of the way. What is accessibility to diesel like, and how much did you spend? Yeah, so I, I didn't keep a tally, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you how much uh, first where it is, 95% um, of the marinas uh, have fuel. So from, we fueled up, uh, we fueled up in, in Kingston before leaving. I fueled up again at Iroquois just to make sure. And then I fueled up again, Quebec City I think. Um, so, uh, and, and my boat takes um, it's two I got it here I forgot the number now that I've been talking for a while I have it um, so I, I go through about um, two liters an hour at five knots if I go at six knots or when I went to Montreal I went back up at 4,000 RPM to get through that, that current, I probably uh, did a lot. But I fueled up, um, four, five, six. I fueled up six times, and every time was about um, 
about 40 liters. I never went below. My tank could take 65 liters, and I didn't go. I always had at least 20 liters in the tank. I, I'd fuel up every time. So, good. Any more questions? Is there questions online? Or? Um, do you want to get the questions online, please, uh, Mark? Meanwhile, uh, I was going to ask you about those lines that they dropped to you. Uh, when I went through the Erie Canal, the lines were encased with slime. <laughs> and so when you grabbed them, you wanted to have rubber gloves. I don't know whether it's the same problem here. Yes, but <laughs> like, like uh, somebody talked and said about, the, you talked about the, the weather, it was really cold. So the water was not that dirty yet, and it was in June. And those ropes that they send to you, they're not used for the big ships. The ships have got their real mooring, and they've got their own lines. There's only for, for uh, pleasure crafts. So the lines were not that bad. They were dirty, but you guys handled the, I didn't, I handled the, the wheel, right? So Charlie, <laughs> how, how dirty were they? They were fine. They were, fine. They were not that bad. <laughs> because he was handling the lines, <laughs> right, Renee? <laughs> uh, we have a question from people online, uh, from Peter Byron. I hope I said that, said that right. Dan, would you repeat your trip? It seems it was challenging for a sailboat. I would do it in a powerboat. Okay. It was not really a sailing trip, but again, uh, I had... I don't know, uh, out of the 30 days or 35 days that I had, I mean, I had four days with decent wind and there were no waves. So you do it again, maybe you have, but the channel effect of the lake, of the river, mm -hmm. where it's going north and south, that the river is not meant. Charlie's done the trip all the way. Did you have decent wind? No. no, no. no. So I think uh, Will Mosier did it on his cat and had better winds and he managed to sail a, a good part of it. But uh, no, I, I would do it on the powerboat, not in the sailboat again. Power, powerboat or your motorcycle? I did it on the motorcycle. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks. That's it. Any other questions? Oh, the other question. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. I guess uh, that uh, concludes uh, all the questions. So uh, I uh, wanted to uh, mention to you that uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, this talk and uh, uh, putting it together and telling us all about it. Um, the regalia shop, uh, at one time we presented caps, but everybody has caps, including the one you're wearing. And so uh, now <laughs> we give you the opportunity to uh, uh, get something at a regalia shop here in uh, NSC. So I'll uh, present this to you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> so thank you, everybody. What's up? Yeah, you have to share that, I think. Uh, and I, maybe I, with the cat, too. I don't she's, know. She's not happy that she doesn't have one of these. Yeah. I got it at a boat show in Paris, and they gave it to me because I own a Benetton. <laughs> and I came home with one. I should have came home with two. So I guess she's getting something from the regalia. <laughs> um, do we have a count yet as to uh, the amount of money uh, we raised here uh, tonight, uh, Mark? We don't. Oh, okay. Well, trust us, there is a number. I guess we're still counting. Maybe that's a good night. So, again, next week uh, we're going to have Eric Fleury back again. He's going to uh, talk about uh, uh, wiring, uh, solar, uh, converting to uh, lithium batteries, and a number of other topics like that. And uh, so, Thank you very much for your attendance, and uh, that's the, it for tonight. Uh, we'll see you all here next week. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Dan. You're welcome.